I'm Rama Fox, and I've been in MSIA since 1969. Um, I was in Miami, Florida, and I was going to seminars there. Um, and uh, JR used to be a school teacher, and on spring break, he offered to come out to Miami in the spring of 1970, and I invited him to my house. So, um, to stay, to be a guest in the house. And he said yes. So back then, JR did light studies and, and we had um, an assistant that did aura balances. And this whole thing took place in my house. It, I mean, when I say a whole thing, there was so much going on with people in the beginning of um, MSIA in Miami. And one day I, he was sitting by himself, and I said, JR, um, can I talk to you? And he, he said, yeah, what's up? And I said, you're not at all what I thought you would be. And he said, well, what were you expecting, like maybe Jesus? And I said, I don't know, but um, you're, you're always ahead of me. I feel like Alice in the Alice in Wonderland following the White Rabbit. And he says, I'll make a deal with you neither believe nor disbelieve anything that I tell you and check it out for yourself. And then if it works for you, that's great. And if it doesn't work for you, no problem. And he says, I don't want a bunch of sheep around me. I want people who want to be awakened. Well, that laid down a foundation for me that later when I started doing the Travelers Through the Ages class, which leads up to even currently, and I'm always a student. I mean, there's no, no matter how much I learn or, or awaken to, it's just a piece of the, the hugeness that's there. The, it's in, infinite what is there. And so I started studying um, in one of the travelers, Hermes Trismegistus, and he was also in the Egyptian um, panthology. He was Thoth. And when I started studying with Thoth, and JR is always with me, and any traveler that I'm studying through the ages, JR, it's like JR is standing right here, like my best friend, my guardian. It's not like he monitors or tells me yes or no or right or wrong. He doesn't do that. It is his power, his aura, his wisdom, his, his just his incredible acceptance and inclusiveness and compassion and all of it is so I'm kind of in that aura when I'm working with another traveler. And what happened with Thoth who uh, the Emerald Tablets, which um, Alexander the Great found and took those tablets and created Alexandria just to show those tablets. Um, I mean, they were so extraordinary. And the Emerald Tablets is was written by Thoth in Atlantean. And um, he talks about coming from Atlantis. He talks about coming from off, um, you know, uh, off planet. And so I started, he, he took me to the Sumerian tablets. When I say took me, he led me um, in my consciousness to start looking up the Sumerian um, tablets and I think they were discovered in the uh, the middle 1800s or something. When you say he, J.R. or Thoth? Thoth. Okay. Yeah, keep... J.R. is always present. Okay, keep going. Uh, and um, so, but Thoth took me to, uh, it's like there are multiple levels going on simultaneously all the time. So Thoth put it into my consciousness um, it's not like really that way. It's sort of like how we're talking, only it's on another level. And then there are other levels. It just depends on which one you're focusing on. And um, being with JR just eventually 
that just starts to happen where you become aware of different levels. And some people can be in those different levels and not even notice that they have switched levels. I just happen to notice. And so anyway, Thoth suggested um, that I look up the Sumerian tablets, which I did. And when they were discovered in, um, in Sumeria, right around where Iraq is, uh, or Baghdad, um, right near Baghdad, um, when they were discovered, there were like 30,000 uh, 30, of them initially found. And they're tablets about this big. And they're written in cuneiform. Well, nobody knew how to read cuneiform. And subsequent to that finding, they found over 300,000 of them now. And in these tablets, eventually, um, be, people started to be able to, uh, from Babylonian and Mesopotamian language, they started to put together what was in the cuneiform. And, um, and then, um, to their surprise, it starts to talk about these people who came 450,000 years ago from a planet that is in our solar system, but in an entirely different orbit that is so huge that it takes 26,000 years for it to make its orbit. And so they live in an entirely different kind of timeline. And, and I'm, by the way, when I'm talking about this, I'm not suggesting anybody believe it or, or not. It's just the information is so extraordinary. And because I didn't feel the need to disbelieve it or believe it, I had this freedom to just observe and have whatever experience that I did. And it was so liberating not to have to do that because what Thoth said is, if you believe something, then you must disbelieve other things. And if you disbelieve, you must then believe other things and either one locks you in. And if you want to be step into the universe, which is where we, what we are, we're infinite beings. Well, then you, why would we keep ourselves bound in these systems? And I did say, how in the world, if I don't believe something or disbelieve it, how do I make choices? And what Thoth said to me was, observe, just observe. And then if you need to make a move or a decision, you check inside, which JR called the traveler within. And um, so just check that and you will have an immediate answer. And that's all you need. You don't need to have an answer that's going to now work for the rest of your life. Um, so anyway, I started reading the, uh, the things about the Anunnaki and in those Sumerian tablets, and they figure that the Sumerian tablets are between... So question, Sumerian in Samaria, Israel, where the Holy of Holies were? Uh, no, this is uh, near the Baghdad area. That's where the dig is. And um, so in the Sumerian tablets, they figure are between six and 12,000 years old, depending on who's you know, looking at them. In these tablets, they're talking about this race of beings that came from this other planet and um, 450,000 years ago, they came to Earth to mine gold. And they needed gold because of the qualities of gold. They wanted to disperse it in their atmosphere because their planet's atmosphere was... Uh, degrading and that was the only thing they could do so they did this major mining thing and they would it didn't take them long to come from their planet like much of what we hear now where there's the anti-gravitational transportation and so it's instantaneous kind of stuff anyway they came here and in the Sumerian tablets the Anunnaki described to these to the Sumerians our solar system, and they call Earth the seventh planet 
because coming from the what we call the outside of our solar system, we are the seventh one in. We call ourselves the third planet because we're third from the sun. And um, they talked about um, the constellations, 365 days, 12 months, musical instruments, the wheel. I mean, this is like before any of this stuff was supposed to have been discovered here. And um, they talk about how they took these existing beings here and did um, gene splicing with them. It's in the tablets. This is what they don't call them genes. They call it they call it different, but you can recognize what it is. And they create humans, and they call them uh, the the atoms or atom. And then they had this place where they kept them which was Eden. And, the, I mean, they're, they're talking about Adam, and they're talking about what we call the Garden of Eden. And everything that is in the Old Testament about creation, it's in the Sumerian tablets already, and even more largely described. And um, they... I'm trying to think of what... One of the things was I noticed is um, they were not beings who had, they had superior knowledge, but they didn't have superior beingness. They, they were still um, in the realms of duality. They still had power plays. They... Um, and I wonder, because the genes, the splicing that they did, were Anunnaki genes that they put into us. And even today, the, the people who work with genes, they say that there are, there's chromosomes there that they cannot recognize that are not from this planet. And um, so I just neither believe nor disbelieve, but I wonder. Does that, you know, would that, according to the tablets, what they're saying and what the people who work with genes are saying, could it be that we're part Anunnaki? And um, then Noah is mentioned in there, in, in the tablets. Um, and in the tablets, which, again, have far more information than the, New, the Old Testament has, but you'll you'll see the same things, and with Noah, um, while he was building the ark, what they were doing, putting in the ark, according to the tablets, was like the DNA of all the animals, not the animals, not the birds, the DNA, the seeds of flowers. They had like. Uh, this huge, huge thing that they built, and they kept everything so that they could repopulate. And obviously, not everybody was wiped off of what the scientists call the deluge, because it's, there's evidence that about between ten and 12,000 years ago, this deluge happened. It's also in the books of Gilgamesh. Yes. Gilgamesh is also mentioned in the Sumerian tablets. Wow. And his story is quite a story. And he eventually goes to Noah and has a, um, because Noah was given the gift of um, the kind of very elongated lifetime that the Anunnaki's had. And initially, the people that the Anunnaki's created had very long lifetimes. And if in the Mesopotamian and the Babylonian tablets, they list the names of kings and the the uh, dates of their reigning, and it, some of them were thousands of years. So I mean, it was a whole different kind of sort of like you know we look at a squirrel or a dog or something, and we're living with them, but they have a different life pattern. And we just assume we've got the longest life pattern, uh, maybe except for a tortoise or something. I don't know. I'm not a 
you know, I'm not well trained and knowledgeable in that. Um, but then Noah seemed to be sort of like the last one that had that extended kind of um, lifetime. And so Gilgamesh then went to, to see Noah to see if somehow he could get that, if there was something he could do. And um, anyway, to see the stories that were, uh, how they were presented in the Sumerian tablets is it fills in so much that the Old Testament clearly, uh, <clears throat> you know how the, um, what do they call it, um, the verbal passing of, of stories. Um, um, oral stories. Yeah. And, I mean, right now you can see, like you can go on YouTube and see that they have this four-year-old girl who's Muslim and she can repeat the Quran from beginning to end without any reference, without stopping. That's how it was in the old days. That's right. And so people, because we're so used to misinformation and um, things that are written and then retranslated and all that, when they did that oral stuff, that was sacred. And it you had to pass the tests of people who already were totally proficient in it before you were then allowed to become known as proficient in that and to carry on the oral tradition. And that that's something that we're not used to, you know, here. Um, By the way, I have to put in, Jared told me he was Gilgamesh. So it's interesting how in the writings here, then Gilgamesh meets Noah. So it's almost like, wow, you know. Do you want to go into, uh, and it also, the Anaki seem very similar to the Elohims that Jer was talking about, these gods that impregnate the people down here, and then they're almost like gods, but not, you know. It wasn't um, my understanding, yeah. okay? Because I was, <clears throat> if I was there, I don't have any memory of it. Um, so I'm just speaking from <clears throat> what I read and what... Um, Foth and JR were assisting me with when I would look at something. And um, what they did, they had a, a thing of brothers and sisters mated with one another. It was all a bloodline thing. And they didn't really, they, they would have relation, because they lived so many years, I mean, like tens and 20,000 years, I mean, it seems inconceivable to us, but that's what these tablets say. And because there's so much in the tablets that are provable, like where the constellations are, all these different things um, that are in there, it's uh, one has a tendency to say, well, gee, maybe this is true, This these number of years. And... Um, but what they did, they would have relationships, but the leaders and everything were only taken from the the purest bloodline. Right. And so it was when they came here and, and it was there were these two brothers, Enlil and Enki. And Enlil they were had uh the same father, not the same mother. And um Enlil was the older, so he was like more in rank than Enki. And Enlil, the, the, the Sumerians didn't believe in, I mean, they knew how the, the splicing of uh, genes and everything. They were very familiar with that. And Enlil, who was staying on planet, I mean, excuse me, Enki was staying on planet, working with all the people, creating this Adamic thing. And he used his genes, he and his sister, who was the geneticist, she took his DNA and spliced it into the people who then became the Adamic ones. And um, when Enlil heard about that, 
it was a huge brouhaha and it went all the way up to their father uh, who was like the I, I like it almost like an emperor or something like that and so they didn't just go merrily around passing their seed it, w it was very had to be with the right it had to be with another Anunnaki and so when Enlil did this and and he kept doing it and and um, his sister kept working with the genes until <clears throat> the Adamics could then actually breed with one another because initially they were like mules. <clears throat> and um, so he was the one, if we're in the line, if humans are in the line of the Anunnaki, then they come through the Enlil uh, line. Wow. And... Um, when they what the problem was was when they started getting so smart and they started the population was growing and they were replicating themselves and that's what Enki wanted them to be able to replicate so that there would be a bigger uh, workforce to mine the gold and initially they took the gold from the oceans, which was easier, but then they ran out of it and it wasn't so easy. And so they started going into the earth and that's when it got really difficult and they really needed workers. And so that that's, I mean, it, it wasn't like they were saying, oh, we're gonna create this new race of people. Isn't it gonna be wonderful? You know, that wasn't their intention according to the, the Sumerian tablets. Um, so it's, you know, like I'm everywhere. Like I remember JR saying that the Mayan people, which if you look at the map by Yucatan, mm -hmm. they just transcended like a UFO just took, there was a, a planet there or a piece of land and they just ascended. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like there's so many, and I, and I immediately I was going to, uh, Greek mythology with Zeus being the head guy so mm -hmm. it seems like everything parallels everything else. It does and one of the things that um, the um, um, a, uh, a, oh my goodness the, the, the name of the science where people go to different sites around the world uh, and for some the word is just eluding me right now but all over the planet there are the same symbols. Yeah. There are pyramids now they have found all over the planet. And um, there are, there's uh, the ability, there's LADAR, I think, or LIDAR um, that can go down into the earth and um, take pictures. And Thoth mentioned that he built the pyramids and that there were these um, I forget how he referred to them, but they would be like levels under the pyramid. Or where, ley lines? No, 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 no. They're structures. Oh, wow. Yeah, huge. Football, many football wow. field size. Wow. And um, they discovered uh, recently through the LIDAR down into the earth that there are these huge things under the pyramid. And, and they're not connected, they're set, they're huge, really, really huge. And um, so he, he talked about that, he talked about the Sphinx, which has been around like a really long time. I mean, reading the Sumerian tablets is absolutely fascinating. Wow. And what the, our supposed history, you know, the human, mankind history is, that we are taught is so limited in comparison to if you, if you start studying the Sumerian tablets. It includes the history that we have been taught, but so much more. And now archeologists, um, they're, they're saying, how could this be that, that supposedly Egyptian 
symbols are turning up in South America. And that's another thing that the Sumerian tablets go into is that the Anunnaki didn't just stay in the uh, Turkish area and you know where Baghdad is now and all of that. They were all over the planet. And they are now finding what they call, um, oh God, the term just went out of my head now, but they're, they're finding evidence of the same kind of things all over the planet. Oh, you know, very, very old things. In the beginning of MSIA, J.R. would refer to the Purple Rose, but he didn't say what it was. And um, when we found prana, what we later called prana, um, J.R. called it the Purple Rose Ashram of the New Age, prana. And so it was the Purple Rose Ashram. Purple Rose, okay. After my in, uh, soul initiation, I was meditating and suddenly just, I mean, I wasn't thinking about the purple rose and boom, there it was. And um, what it is in my perception and what I wrote in the article, which JR, you know. I remember. Okay, so, but people, I mean, you know, they may go, well, that's just... Ram is a daydream or something, but J.R. said that it was all valid. So what I saw was it was more like, um, almost more like a lotus, but all these petals, <clears throat> all of them, all connected in the center and in the perimeter of all the petals. And I knew, I knew it was a purple rose. I didn't figure it out. I simply knew. That's that direct reasoning that happens or direct knowledge uh, that occurs on certain levels of consciousness. And so anyway, every petal is a universe. And on the perimeter of the petal, and there are, it's all purple, shade, diff, varying shades of purple. And the perimeter is moving. And some perimeters are going in one direction, some in another, and they all come together in the center and that is brilliant white. And that is the seat of the preceptor. Wow. And um, so I just looked at it, and it wasn't like, oh, what is this and what is that? It wasn't like a mental thing for me. It was just given to me to know. And I didn't speak about it to anyone. I did write about it to JR. And um, no, no, I talked to him on the phone about it. And then he called me, I don't know, some weeks later, and he told me that I was one of the few people who had ever seen it. Wow. And so he called me and asked me if I would tell, would I mind talking to somebody um, and tell them what I saw? And of course I didn't mind. And um, so I did do that, but that's the only other person than JR that I ever talked to about Purple Rose until mm, who was that person i don't remember i no. didn't even know the person you know um so then it came to me when i saw the uh the hubble deep space um filming where like they would see like the whole array of stars in the universe and they would see spaces that appeared to not, you know, not have anything in them. And so they trained the Hubble on the, the, that particular space uh, for like 10 or 11 days. And it came for, because it took time for the light from those to come. And there were billions of stars with billions of planets just in that time, like a little grain of sand in the heavens. And um, and then they they show you what how, how it came to Hubble, and it moved me so deeply. And I realized 
and, and this may sound, and again, I'm not trying to get anybody to believe anything, but I realized that that is our body on that level. I mean, we are being, we are tra trained and accepted the training to come here and, and experience this contracted small consciousness uh, as a personality and a soul that operates in this, like JR said, I forget how much percentage he said was the, the ego and the personality and all of that and how much was like the soul was a very tiny part of what was um, controlling what was going on here and um, that we're so persuaded by our mind and our emotions and our ego which we that's what takes a while for a lot of us not all of us but a lot of us um, to be, begin to be have soul awareness and thank God for JR because I certainly didn't have soul awareness um, and oh gosh I just kind of lost where I was there um, oh the, the purple rose so then after I saw this Hubble thing which really moved me and I don't know why the association was there but I started thinking about the purple rose again and I wrote to JR and I said um, I told him you know, what happened with the Hubble, and that was it appropriate now for me to share with people about the Purple Rose? And he said, yes, write it out. And so I did. And um, he made some very, very minor uh, adjustments to it, and he sent it to the New Day Herald. So... That's great. Do you remember the year? So people can look it up? The year of the New Day Herald? Yeah. Um, I have the article, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. It was probably, it was in the, um, it was in the 1990s. Um, okay, I'll have it look yeah. at it. So let's segue to The Secret of Soul Transcendence. Okay, um, after JR came to my house in the spring of 1970, then uh, because he was a school teacher and back then they had long summer breaks and he would take the summer breaks and go traveling around the US, Canada, whatever, by car. And um, so I, he had invited me to come to his house because there was a, um, a conference and then he was going to go traveling. So I came to his house and stayed at his house guest. And um, then right before he was going to go traveling, and I was going to hang out at his house for a little while before I went back to Miami. So I said, JR, is there anything I can do for you? And he said, well, let me think about it. And then in a little while, he brought out this bottom of a shoebox full of audio tapes. And he said, I don't know what's in here. Um, I, if, if you feel like it. I mean, he was always so polite and, and thoughtful. And anyway, uh, he said, if you feel like it, I'd really appreciate if you could identify what's on these tapes. So I was thrilled and I took them back to Miami and I'm listening to them and, you know, identifying the tape and writing down, you know, just briefly what's on them. And then I started hearing, if you would know the secret of soul transcendence, then look only for the good. That is the divine in people and things and leave all the rest to God. And I listened to this thing over and over and over. It was really moving me. And that's basically the part of it that everyone recites now. But what's under it is the thing that holds all of that. It tells you how to do it in a sense. And that is 
whether you see something as good or bad or right or wrong, and this is not the exact words, um, but it's basically the right words, it, that we can't, uh, if we see something as good or bad or right or wrong or, or ugly or beautiful or intelligent or unintelligent, it's actually an aspect of our own consciousness being made manifest to us. And that we can't afford to have a discourteous thought in our consciousness about anything. And the great reality is that everything is part of a vast cosmic orchestra and essential to the overall and harmonious playing of the whole. So when I notice a judgment I have or a sense of separation or whatever, I realize that what I'm experiencing is an aspect of my own consciousness being mirrored to me. And it takes, it brings me into greater ownership and the recognition that if I'm, if I'm experiencing separation, it's an illusion and it's just some manifestation of my consciousness. And somehow that is so freeing. Now, when I first transcribed that, I knew, this was back in 1970, I knew that was my life lesson. Knew it. In completion, my life lesson. And it is to this day. Right now, sitting here in this room, it is my life lesson. And when I started back then looking at Everything is a manifestation of my own consciousness. I didn't understand it. I knew that it was true, but my mind didn't understand how that could be. And now I do understand. I mean, I understand a great deal of it, but I didn't understand then. And like when I'm looking at you, I understand that you are a part of me and I am talking to a part of me. And you, as a part of me, are creating this symbiotic, synergistic frequency where it's like where two or more are gathered in my name. Then a greater manifestation, a greater light comes forward. And so as I'm sitting here talking to you, I understand that you're J. Sue Garcia and I'm Rama but another part of me is seeing me like I'm looking in a mirror. And another part of me on another level, um, now, now I'm getting really, um, it's getting really large, and the larger it gets, the harder it is to talk about. I don't know how JR did it. I don't know how he did it. I know when I had my soul initiation and I was perfectly conscious through the whole thing and I went into deep into God consciousness into realms of light that were amazingly breathtakingly extraordinary and then I came into the awareness of light that was so rapture is so exquisite I couldn't stand it I had to back away and my understanding when and after I finished this soul initiation which happened maybe maybe it took like 45 minutes or something I mean it was really extended and huge <coughs> um, then the phone rang and it was JR and um, I I said, JR, you didn't tell us. You lied. And he said, that's right. He says, how could I ever tell anyone this? You can't, you can't talk about it. It's not that it's forbidden. It's just you can't do it. And what I understood, without having to figure it out, is the 
people who had reached a certain level in their soul awakening that weren't ready to accept that everything they were perceiving was an aspect of their own consciousness. They were projecting things onto JR as if he were that and what they were experiencing was aspects of their own consciousness that they didn't know how to accept and love. So they kind of unloaded it on him. And what I realized, what the things that people were saying about him were, it, it's like saying Rama is no good because she has a piece of dust on this particular hair. I mean, it, it, it was ludicrous having gone to the, the dimensions, what I have seen and where the traveler consciousness isn't, it's everywhere. <laughs> and I don't know how all those years he was with us, loving us, patient with us, infinitely telling us the same things so that we could awaken to one little level and then another little level of it and another little level of it. I don't know how he did it. I mean, I am so in awe of this man, this consciousness, this being. And then I keep hearing him say, and we are one. So with that said, talk about master teaching. That Wow. Uh, he, to me, this is one of the most elegant of the teachings of J.R., and he never talked about it. You had to have the experience and grok it. And I'll give you an example. He was in town. Um, he and I were alone in my car. I was driving. We were going somewhere, and he said by the way, and he mentioned a person's name in Miami, uh, I wouldn't trust this person. He, he says this. Now, he has been saying, don't gossip, say only kind words, you know, all this. And it's like, wow, this didn't sound like the teaching. It's like, was he being hypocritical or whatever? And this person that he said this about was doing so much positive and loving for MSIA. And to my disgust, I found myself saying, I know JR, as if I was agreeing with him, because I wanted JR's approval so much. And JR, from the passenger seat, looked over at me the driver's seat and just looked at me didn't say a word turned and looked out the window and I felt awful I felt simply dreadful and I was so angry at him I was angry and I mean it just that is so hypocritical. What does he say about me behind my back? And blah, 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 blah. But I didn't say that to him. I didn't say, JR, I'm having this feeling of, you know, upset or whatever. I just went ahead with my really nice way of being with him. Because I knew he was my, my traveler. My, I knew he was my guide. It wasn't that. It's just I didn't like what he did and how I felt about myself. It took me three months, J. Sue. I'm sitting at on the beach and by myself in its sunset, and suddenly it hit me what he did. If he had said to me, Rama, you have this trait where you are so addicted to being accepted and wanting approval that you will agree with anything to, a, to 
to get that agreement. And of course, it's to, to a degree, but it was a big trait of mine. And if he started describing it and how I would um, sublimate the true feelings of my heart and my being just to get approval from some outside source because I gave approval to myself so little, if he was to say that to me, I wouldn't be able to get it. I just wouldn't. And it took me that process. And then I realized what he had done is he had given me the experience. And the that's, to me, the master teacher. And what he used to do all the time is he would talk from the traveler. And man, I mean, people be transported it was incredible. And then he would do all these funky human things. And it was like, what, what? And what he was training us to do, and this is the master teaching, instead of him always presenting himself as this perfect being, he would be very, very human, and then he would manifest the traveler. And it was up to us to tune into what we were experiencing. And we could only do that through the traveler within. That, to me, was an elegance of teaching. And he didn't say, okay, now I'm going to manifest the traveler. Okay, pause. Now I'm going to manifest the human and do gossip and whatever. He didn't do that. He didn't give us heads up. It was up to us to catch on to what was going on. And I'm sure that you experienced that. I, I was laughing with you because that happened to me all the time. Casa Vega is a little town. and See, JR would come in the summer when he had more time. or he, It depends, but it was always a break in school. And um, he would come out to Miami. And after he did the, you know, whether we had a conference or, and he would do light studies and he would do seminars and all of that, then there was always some free time. And so, uh, and I would be the chauffeur. And so he said, I want to go to Casa Vega. I never heard of Casa Vega, but it's, and it's still there. I looked it up, um, I don't know, some years back. It's this little town toward St. Augustine in Florida. And it is, I would say, at least 90% psychics. And you can go up to any house without an appointment, knock on the door, and get a reading. And so I went with JR, and he would take me to these things. I mean, he took me to all sorts of things. And, um, I mean, some of the craziest stuff that he would take me to. And anyway, um, he's going in and, and having people give him a reading. And I mean... It was amazing how many of them were sick. Some of them were in bed, really couldn't even get out of bed. And I was thinking to myself, why is he doing this? It didn't occur to me at the time that he was bringing light to all these people, that they were locked in this, this energy pool and... Um, the suffering that they were experiencing by channeling and by doing the things that they were doing and not knowing how to clear themselves, not knowing how to see from a higher consciousness. They were packing themselves into these uh, limited and limiting realities. And from his compassion, he went there and spent his time and went there to do that for these people. And it took me a while to grasp what he had done. Wow. So lastly, talk about spiritual promise. Um, in that shoe box where the um, uh, Secret of Soul Transcendence yeah. was, uh, was another tape. I mean, it was full of tapes, but there was this other one that just knocked my socks off and I kept re you know running it back rewinding it listening to it over rewinding listening to it again it was just incredible and I realized this this 
has to be written down, like the secret of soul transcendence had to be written down and shared. So it was so beautiful to me. And there was a um, Maureen, I can't remember Maureen's last name. She's no longer on the planet, but she was a calligrapher. And I got this image to create a book. And um, totally out of what JR said in the spiritual promise. And so we would take like a artboard about that big and she would write the words and, ha and we would come up with some kind of image that was somewhat reflective of the meaning in the words. And um, so we got it done for the next time that JR came into town. And so I remember he was sitting on my couch and um, I brought him this stack of artboard. Didn't say, it, I just handed it to him. And it, on the first cover, it said, The Spiritual Promise, and it just had JR's name down at the bottom. And he turned it, and then there was the forward that I had written of how, how that came about. And then all the rest of it was as he said it. I mean, it was perfect. It was, and it just, he, it just flowed out of him. And he's sitting there and he looks up at me and his eyes get really pink and wet. And he said, this is my first book. And so the book was published. I had a very rich boyfriend and he asked me, tell me a gift you want. And I said, I want to publish this book. He says, no, 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 I mean a piece of jewelry or something. And I said, no, I'm going to publish this book. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we went and I went and designed the book and got it published. And then, you know, the MSI had it for sale. And somebody sent the copy of the book to someone in Australia. And this was back when long distance calls were really expensive. I get this call from a guy in Australia and I do not remember his name, but I'm sure that Australians know the first person that, you know, brought MSIA to Australia. And he talked to me for an hour and a half long distance and obviously I mean JR was was in that conversation in such a way that you know it's very clear what happened in Australia well uh, we are at the end would you like to say is it that's JR would you like to say something as we end because I'm going to be leaving. <laughs> uh, thank you. No, I don't. I mean, Jr. talked about it. I mean, he didn't talk about it. What do you remember that he said about it? Just like... Oh, he would just say, oh, that was back in Lemuria. And that's before Atlantis, right? Yeah. And he also... Um, he would come into the house or something and he would go, oh, there's a UFO outside. And he talked about people in the center of the earth uh, and that it, it was hollow there. And, you know, and I thought, well, you know, God bless JR. He says these such interesting things. But I never thought to say, would you extrapolate on that? Well, then later I read about Admiral Byrd going there and uh, going to Antarctica and being his plane being taken into the center of the earth and what the people told him. And then he came out and um, the guy that was the um, forestal, uh, the Navy, um, he had the Department of Defense, the uh, forestal, and he and uh, Admiral Byrd 
were so, uh, so close and he got what Bird was saying was accurate and they were intending to come out and tell the world about what was going on. This is all according to Bird's records and um, the um, Forrestal was somehow suddenly found to be incompetent, put into this very tall building of mental, where people with mental illness were kept. Mm. And he, from my point of view, they said he, su he s committed suicide from 18 stories. I think he was suicided. And Admiral Byrd from then on didn't say a word. And he only allowed his information to be published after his death. Yeah, part of uh, my experience with JR is everything that we wanted out of him, we saw in X Files, the TV show. <laughs> yeah. And he, JR would watch it with us. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the hour, he'd go, Yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> and so <laughs> X Files was really just revealing just about everything that was Gnostic that JR, you know, yeah. we would have to dig out of him. Yeah. But... He said, uh, He said that when people would say, Well, where did the movement come from? And he had said, well, it's an amalgamation of wisdom that just exists, timeless. And the closest that we have here is Sufism and Gnosticism. And, but then he would say that Jesus is the head, the head of it, the Christ. 